Recovery failure. So regardless of any of the diseases that you had on the first page, any of those can go into respiratory failure. So this is automatically a worsening condition. So any of those diseases, um, airway diseases, alveoli diseases, um, what are the other ones? I don't even remember now. Effusions, hemothorax, pneumothorax, any of them can go into respiratory failure. And so I want to give you the criteria for respiratory failure so you can imagine that this would be important. Come on. Are you not going? There we go. Oh, it's going to go forward about 800 slides now. Hang on. If I keep pressing buttons, I'm going to pause for a minute. All right, so here, this is important slide. Important slide. Important slide. Important slide alert. This is the definition of respiratory failure. So if your patient has any of these, they could be considered in respiratory failure. But notice, they have to have these well on 60% or more of oxygen. So if you're on 40% face masks, you could still, you got a ways to go before you're in respiratory failure. You have to be on 60% or more with these symptoms to be considered truly respiratory failure. You could be on your way to respiratory failure. But respiratory failure is hypoxemia, meaning when you draw blood, that PO2 level or the oxygen level in your blood is low. What's our normal if we drew 80 to 100? So they give you quite a ways to go before they call you respiratory failure. That's a PO2 of 60. That's pretty low. That's pretty dang low. So to be considered in respiratory failure, requiring more and more interventions, um, that's pretty low. Now, does that mean we will never touch a patient until they're in respiratory failure? Heck no, but this is the definition of respiratory failure. Hypercapnia. What is a normal CO2? <laughs> 35 to 45, so they're saying anything about 45, with a pH of less than 735, which means they are acidosis, right? The respiratory acidosis, so pH 732 and a CO2 of 48, that could be considered respiratory failure if you are on 60% or more. Uh, so you get one or more of the following, so you don't have to hit all three. You can have a PO2 of 80 in respiratory failure if you are hypercapnic. Um, and then you have hypoxia, which is basically what we will see on assessment or what the patient will report to you. These are signs and symptoms of hypoxemia. So hypoxemia is just having no oxygen in your bloodstream circulating. Hypercapnia is having too much CO2 circulating in your bloodstream. And hypoxia is just your signs and symptoms of being low oxygen state. So you could have one or more of the following. So you could have a patient on 60% having hypoxia, but yet their PO2 isn't low yet, and they are not acidotic yet, but they are having an increased work of breathing that is causing them to be in respiratory failure. So let's look at the actual hypoxia and increased work of breathing. Are we're gonna consider the same thing. You already learned these in block three when you did the anemia lecture, right? Same things, they're back. Hello, welcome back. Um, tachycardia could be a sign. Restlessness, confusion, anxiety. Remember the first thing that we get, some of sometimes our first sign and symptom of hypoxia is they're confused and loopy. Um, rapid shallow breathing, tripoding, sitting up over the table or needing to sit forward to breathe. Orthopnea, having to sit up on pillows or have the head of the bed up to breathe. Difficulty speaking. So when I had pneumonia, I couldn't, man, I was coughing and having trouble getting through a conversation. Can you imagine? <laughs> I could talk for five hours and I couldn't talk. Um, first lip breathing is where you're trying to, what are you doing when you first lip breathe? You're increasing the pressure in your lungs. And I will show you what you are doing. You're actually giving yourself peep. You are, you're trying to breathe out against pressure to help pop lungs open. Um, respiratory muscle fatigue, this is when you're using your accessory muscles to breathe. 
and I have a picture for you of where all your accessory muscles are. So if your patient is using accessory muscles, is having trouble breathing, and sitting forward tripoding, and they're, you draw an ABG, and their PO2 is 70, and their CO2 is 44, are they in respiratory failure? Yes, because even though they don't have lab values that are right, hypoxia can put you into respiratory failure. So just because your lab values don't reflect it yet, you're still in respiratory failure because you are showing increased work of breathing. It's just a matter of time until your labs hit that point. So if you want to wait, and sometimes docs do wait till their labs hit that point before calling them respiratory failure, but a patient who is tripoding and breathing 40 times a minute and using accessory muscles is in respiratory failure. You only need one of those criteria to fit you into respiratory failure. So if you have hypoxia and increased work of breathing, just because your lab values aren't there yet doesn't mean they're not going to be. Wait an hour and you'll be in full-on defined respiratory failure. So I don't want, so respiratory failure has a long stages and in fact if Carl was here, we're setting him up at the beginning of respiratory failure. So you will see when you go and pull up your Carl thing that he is at the beginning of respiratory failure. And I will show you those signs and symptoms when we pull up. So what I'm going to do is pull up some signs and symptoms and his vital signs in his labs that are showing you which way he's going. And then I will let you finish the case study on your own. But um, so, yes, you can have a patient that's just showing you signs and symptoms that doesn't have these lab values yet. But if they have these lab values, they're definitely there. If their PO2 is low, if their CO2 is high, you're already in respiratory failure. So those COPD patients that come into you with a COPD exacerbation and have a PO2 of 68 and a CO2 of 68 and a pH of 714, are they in respiratory failure? Heck yeah, they already met the lab requirements. The signs and symptoms only add to your diagnosis. But you can have signs and symptoms without the lab values yet. It just means you're on your way down the tunnel and the lab values will reflect it sooner rather than later. But they will get there if you wait long enough. Um, so if you see these things, I would like you to consider these patients in failure, especially if they're doing this. So if they're doing this on two liters of nasal cannula, what are you going to do? They're like, you bump up the oxygen. And it's not working. And so what are you going to put on? A face mask. And you're literally like, whoo, whoo. then what are you going to do? 100% non-rebreather. And now they're doing it on 100% non-rebreather? Respiratory failure. Okay, does that make sense? That's why it's on 60% or more. Once you start to get those partial rebreathers and non-rebreathers and your patient's still doing this, you're in respiratory failure. It's just a matter of time before your labs start to reflect it. Okay? So that's why they allow signs and symptoms uh, of hypoxia on more than 60% to be considered respiratory failure. If it goes away after you bump up the oxygen, hey, we're great. Some of you might have had the SIM patient already that has respiratory failure. If you remember back to the SIM patient, think about your SIM patient, or maybe you're seeing patients that are admitted to the ICU in your critical care that are in respiratory failure. Just think to those patients and look at, think about what they look like. They are having a hard time breathing. These are the accessory muscles in case you don't, um, your core muscles here are your diaphragm and your intercostals. We should be breathing from our ribs and our diaphragm. If they don't work, the pectoralis come in, that's here. And then um, the abdominals and the quads. They're sitting here, they're trying to pull down and these are trying to pull up. So if we start seeing, what you'll see is retractions <clears throat> up here around your neck. You'll see patients trying to breathe. I'm just doing it with my chin, but um, they will, you'll, you'll see these muscles starting to contract. If you see these muscles, they're not supposed to work. These are not supposed to be working to help you breathe. If they're doing that, these respiratory muscles are not doing their job. And that's a sign of someone getting very tired trying to breathe. Respiratory failure. So, what do you do? I made a flow chart for you. Don't leave the patient. You put on the call bell and get some help into your room. 
um, but don't leave the patient. You put them, if you don't already have them, on a pulse box or ask somebody to bring it to you. Monitor their oxygenation, their respiratory rate, and their respiratory effort. If they are gurgling or they need to be suctioned, you can chest peed teeth to them, you can suction them, you can get secretions out of the airway because maybe that will solve your problem. Um, increase oxygen up to 100% to keep the SATs greater than 90. You are free to do that. Your patient is showing signs of respiratory failure. You may protect your ABCs. You may protect your airway and your breathing by suctioning and turning up oxygen. No one will be mad at you for trying to save the patient's breathing. If your patient remains conscious while you do that, you can put them on their partial or 100% non-rebreather. So basically, we're sitting at 40 or 60% face mask. And our patient is either hypoxic or we got EBG results saying this thing is not good. Go ahead and put them on 100% or partial, whatever brings their SATs up. And then the next step after that is non-invasive ventilation with something called CPAP and BiPAP. Have you seen CPAP and BiPAP in the hospital? So what they'll do is these will add a little bit of pressure to the situation and I will play with the lungs and show you what just a little bit of pressure can do to help your lungs. Um, so we're going to go to 100% because remember, anything over 60 and we're having trouble breathing, you're free reign to go to 100. You're in like a respiratory failure. And most hospitals will have a respiratory algorithm for allowing you to go up because airway is important. Suction them, get them on O2s if you need to. And then the next step is non-invasive mechanical ventilation which of course we can't do on our own, we'll need to call, and you can call a CRT, a rapid response, or the doctor to get the next step, which is non-invasive. And we'll talk about each one. If they are unconscious or breathing less than 12 times a minute, if they are unconscious or breathing less than 12 times a minute, because remember 12 to 20 is your normal, right? If you are unconscious or not breathing sufficiently, you may go to bag valve mask and breathe for them until they either wake up enough or until you can get someone in there to help them out along the way. All right, so this kind of like depends on whether your patient's awake and alert, which way you go, and if they are not awake and alert and they're not conscious or they're not maintaining their rests, you may go down that path. Okay. So these are just kind of, we stopped at that other lecture, just going all the way to high flow. And then we're starting to talk about the extra breath. We already talked about the non-rebreather and the partial rebreather. Um, these are, if you went through the code cart lecture with Katie, you saw the nasal trumpets. Those are the little flexible soft ones that you can put. You put them in the nose. They're very soft. You put on a little gel, a little lube. Helps get you a patent airway to the back of the throat. Um, these are not really used so much for airway. They're used for suctioning so that you can suction without nose trauma. You only put in a nasal trumpet once, and then you leave it there, and then you can keep suctioning through it to avoid nasal trauma. We don't usually use it for an airway that much um, because they're not comfortable. They're fine, the patients don't mind letting them sit there, but if we have a problem with the back of our throat or in our trachea, the nasal trumpet won't help all that much. It just basically gets you a clear airway to the back of your throat through your nose. Um, don't put that in anyone with any facial trauma. Don't go shoving anything into their nose. Um, and then for the non-invasive ventilation, we need extra pressure. We need our air going in at extra pressure. Remember I told you the high flow gives you a little extra pressure because the flow is going in so fast. It's like, it kind of pushes some extra pressure in. This is what um, people will do at home if they have sleep apnea. They will be on a CPAP, which just kind of usually goes over their nose and pushes in some extra pressure. And so when they exhale, that extra pressure helps keep the back of their throat open, keep their airways open, and keeps everything open so they breathe a little better at night. Um, so if we use CPAP in the hospital, what they are ordering is the amount of pressure that you have to breathe out against. And so that is what helps pop it open. So I'm going to show you on the lungs after we do this slide. Um, Bi-level is a higher pressure for inspiration, so when you take a breath, it's coming in at you really hard, and then when you exhale, it kind of holds a little bit of pressure to keep those lungs popping. <coughs> so let me do your little, I'm going to do a demo. We're going to intubate the lungs here. 
So we've got our ET tube, and we have a syringe on the end, and the syringe on the end blows up the balloon. So you can see how the balloon's blown up on the end. That holds it into place, so I'm going to put it in here. Normally we put it right to the trachea, but then I have to hold it in for you, and that's not always fun. So I'm going to intubate the, uh, intubate the tube in here and blow up the balloon. So now the, the balloon can't come out. We have an airtight, we have an airtight system here, and when I bag these lungs, then the lung will go. So what I'm going to use here, this is called a peak valve. Have you seen these in the hospital? Probably nobody has ever explained to you. So I'm going to do the bag first and open these lungs without the peak valve. So what's happening here? Look at it inflating and deflating. Every time the lung deflates like this all the way, it actually damages the tissue around there. We don't deflate our lungs all the way. When we breathe in and out, how much air do we take in and out of our lungs? 70. We take in about 10 milliliters per kilogram. So if you're a 100 kilo person, you're taking in and out about 1,000 milliliters of air with each breath. A smaller person may take 500 or 600 mm -hmm. per breath. So this patient's taking, I mean, this whole thing. And you can see how the lungs are not filling up all the way. This area up here is atelectic tissue. It's not inflating, no matter what I do with it. This area here and this area up here, atelectasis. You see how it's not inflating all the way? So we have a lot of atelectasis, even though I'm bagging this patient pretty hard. So now I'm going to put on a magical little thing called a peak valve. And this is basically CPAP. And I will pass one around. You can take a look at it and pass it around. Um, you can choose the level of pressure that you're going to keep in these lungs. It goes from 5 to 20. And so I'm going to start it off with just a peep of 5, which is basically when you put on something at CPAP of 5, what we're doing. We're going to add a little bit of extra pressure. So one last time before I put the peak valve on, watch what our lungs look like. Now I'm going to put the peak valve on, and watch what the lungs do when I when they exhale. It takes them a lot longer to deflate, right? A lot longer to deflate, and some of this atelectic tissue that we have is now starting to pop up. Now I'm going to dial the peak to 10. So I'm going to hold a little. So basically what this means is the exhale is against pressure. It's harder to exhale out. So we're going to now. Now those lungs do not deflate. And look at the atelectic tissue at the top. It's starting to pop open. So now that we have PEEP or CPAP, we are preventing this lung from fully deflating with each breath. So don't you think that would be easier for a patient? Oops. Oh, oh he got extubated. Oh, no. <laughs> Look what happens to his lungs, though, as soon as we remove that pressure. So a patient that is working really hard to breathe when they are not... Look what's happening to their lungs. With each breath, they're just falling apart. It's taking more and more effort to open those lungs and then those lungs are closed into each breath, which is why patients will try to purse with breathe. They will purr. They will push against pressure to give themselves pee. My dad will do this at home. He's a horrible asthmatic. And he will grunt in the chair. He's like, mm, mm, mm. and that's when he's having trouble breathing. He's trying to increase the pressure in those lungs. So when he exhales, he goes, mm. And if you ever work with a, a really bad COPD or asthmatic, they will have coping mechanisms to try and give themselves peak. Because what's happening now with just a little bit of peak is those lungs inflate a lot easier and don't deflate all the way. I'm going to turn the peak to 15, which is kind of high. Look at those lungs. They don't even hardly deflate. So now this patient has to work hard, less and less to get air in, right? 
because the lungs are already popped open. Mm -hmm. And so even a little bit of air mm -hmm. will fill those lungs. That's a lot more restful for a patient that's been working so hard to breathe. And now look at all that atelectic tissue. It's starting to pop open and stay open. So PEEP is magical and wonderful, and we love it. And why every bag that we bag with in the hospital should have a PEEP valve on it. And look at that lung tissue coming back. Now that whole atelectic area is starting to fill up because we're not letting the lungs deflate all the way. It's just like a balloon. As soon as they pop open, it's much easier to stay open. But as soon as they go atelectic, it's very hard to pop open again. And then we'll turn the peak to 20. And now the problem is, imagine with a peak of 20, what's our problem here? We could overinflate. Okay? <laughs> Who wants to be king lung? Uh, but you can see how much better it's doing at popping those lungs open. So when they have a high peep, they're exhaling against pressure. It takes a lot more work to get that lung out, and the lungs stay popped open. So whenever a patient is having trouble breathing, extra pressure is amazing. And that's what we're giving them with CPAP and BiPAP is this extra pressure. And you can see that even if I don't take a breath for a while, those lungs don't collapse all the way like they were before, and they pump up really nice. So, um, PEEP is amazing for patients that uh, don't breathe well. And I don't know if you can see where his bubbles are. You might have to come up and you can play with it. Just keep it on a PEEP of five so we don't blow it <laughs> But some of these areas, like right here and here, are um, holes. And you can sometimes see the air bubbling in there. It doesn't show up on the camera. But um, if you come up and play, you can kind of see. And they've got little pneumos. He's got little pneumos. But it's not going to be an issue because I don't have a closed system around it. But if I had a tight bag around here, that air would end up accumulating inside there. So anyway, I will let you play with those. We'll let you. And then as soon as I take the peak valve off, So, and you can see that these, and this is what's called, um, if lungs are atelectic like this and they're having a hard time opening, it's having a hard time keeping them open. And so if patients have gotten pneumonia and atelectasis and getting really bad, they're sitting there going, and I'm like huffing this thing down, trying to get those lungs open and all. I'm like really squeezing this thing. So you can see how just a whiff of pressure makes a big, big difference for a patient. Even the peep of five, look how pink they are. So I will let you kind of come and pump these lungs. Peep is amazing. We will try to do it for ourselves by per slip breathing. Um, but that's why our next step on this patient, for a patient that is having trouble inflating and deflating, inflating, and they just can't get those lungs popped open, a little bit of extra pressure makes a big, big difference in those lungs. So if we've been letting them go pressure-free for a while, they will get on 100% non-rebreather. But 100% oxygen into those lungs without PEEP doesn't make a big difference to them. They're still opening and closing, opening and closing. They still have a lot of work to open all the way. I was slamming that whole thing in them, and the lungs weren't expanding all the way. As soon as I add the PEEP, I can put less and less and less pressure on so as soon as we get CPAP or BiPAP on a patient, they need less and less air, and the lungs stay open, and they can relax. Okay? Feels good to have that extra air going into a lung that's been working real, real hard. So if you come over and bag these lungs, um, I would say everybody on your way out or so, come over and give it a pump if you want, and then see how much better it is and easier it is to pump with just a little bit of PP. All I have to put it on is 5 or 10 and you're amazing. And so if you can imagine, if your inspiratory pressure goes all the way up to 25, every time you get a breath in, it's putting in a ton of air. And then you're breathing out against 10. You're basically this, when you're breathing out, this exhale. PEEP is called positive end expiratory pressure. So all of this is 
end expiratory pressure. This is just one level in and out. So whatever they're set at, their peak goes all the way to 20, just like that mask does. Um, and theirs goes all the way up. I think it can even go up to 20 if you need it to. But their inspiratory, that exhalation pressure is what's keeping this open. And then this is an extra additional. <sighs> and everything starts getting better. Their accessory muscles relax. They can go back to using their, because they're getting assistance. But as one of my intensivists says, this is ventilation. It's just not through an ET tube. But this is considered a ventilator, CPAP and BiPAP. They're extra just pressure assist. But it is something that if we removed this pressure, they would have a lot of trouble breathing. And so you'll find that I think at Chandler, they only use them on a certain floor, where the ratio is, I think, a three to one. So they don't, because these patients could tip over the end to needing mechanical ventilation very quickly. So just because you're on CPAP or BiPAP does not mean you're out of the woods. It just means we're giving you extra pressure to try and let you get over whatever your issues are. But you can still continue to deteriorate even on CPAP or BiPAP, which would, would require you to um, have more invasive ventilation. So here's just another picture. Here's a couple of pictures of different CPAP and BiPAP patients. Um, I, <laughs> this is a BiPAP mask, kind of one of our bigger ones. We do have full face masks. And it says under here, it says BiPAP patients be like, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> because this is, the, um, this is the mask. And this one's a really nice one. It's got like a little, little skull cap on there to hold, hold it on the head. Um, but it goes over the nose and the middle. And it creates a seal around the nose and the mouth so that all the pressure and oxygen that we give you stay in. So you can imagine that, I mean, they're usually like it at first because it's air when they needed it they need this extra air it feels good um, but you can imagine that it starts to eat at the bridge of the nose after a while now there's also a lot of pressurized air coming out so when these masks are on patients they actually you can actually if they're on a lot of BiPAP you can see them actually rise and fall with each breath because there's so much pressure underneath these things but we try to keep a seal and pay attention to a patient if you have them on BiPAP in your critical care clinical or not. Um, the other problem with these is any air leak, they don't get the prescribed amount of pressure. So patients with NG tubes or things it will affect the air leak around it if they're releasing air. And most of these BiPAP machines just alarm and alarm and alarm and alarm. But really what it is is it's a super face mask that allows for a great seal so that you can provide this pressure. And some patients you'll see their cheeks puff out. Um, and if it's not working for the patient, it needs to be adjusted. So respiratory is constantly in the room doing adjustments for it, changing the pressures to make it, try and make it more comfortable. But this is a lot of pressure that is coming out with each breath and then staying with each exhale. So um, there's just some pictures of how the CPAP and the BiPAP work. But what it is, is it's non-invasive, meaning it's delivered by a mask, Pressure, positive pressure ventilation. So you are ventilating the patient just with pressure. So let's say that's not working. Maybe they become unconscious while they're getting their CPAP or their BiPAP. Um, can every single, can conscious and unconscious patients use this? We do not use this on unconscious or unresponsive patients. Reason being, maybe you get nauseous, maybe you throw up. You're going to get that all pushed into your lungs with the next breath. You have to be able to remove the mask if something's going wrong. And so if you do not have enough ability to remove the mask if there's a problem, then they won't put you on BiPAP. So if you are too lethargic or unconscious, or you can't stay in the room with the patient, um, then this is not appropriate for them. They need to be conscious and aware of what they're doing, because if they start to feel sick to their stomach or whatever, they can remove the mask. And the alarm will go off, and you'll come in the room, but they won't aspirate. Very high risk of aspiration with the BiPAP mask, because, yes, if you have anything in your mouth, it could get pushed into your airway at a pressure of 20 or something. So, yeah, we would want to... Um, 
not give this to unconscious or unresponsive patients that can't remove the mask. Um, if you are unconscious or you need something, um, if you need to open their airway, you can use an oral airway. You can look for these in the coat cart when we find them. We have the nasal trumpets in the oral airways in the cart. You remember how to measure those? Have you been taught how to measure them? Mouth to ear. And then we just kind of match the same amount. I mean, I'm sure there's something, but I just like this and then take that measurement to the thing. Um, bag valve mask so that we can help the patient breathe. The better the seal, the better. And definitely use the peak valve. There is a video if you would like to see a, um, a video of it so you can remember the demo. This video is exactly the same, the pig lungs with peep. Um, so that video is what I used to use before Katie bought me lungs. Now Katie bought me lungs. I'm like, yeah, you can do it here. Um, and then that way it's kind of fun because you get to do it too. Um, so bag valve mask with the peak valve. And then the next, if you're going to need ventilation, the patient becomes unconscious while on BiPAP or is unresponsive or isn't um, maintaining their airway even on BiPAP or CPAP, we will intubate them and do mechanical ventilation. So you can intubate, which is, you could be oral or nasal. You could put the tube down the nose. You can put the tube down the mouth. Um, they can also do a tracheostomy. All three of them go to the trachea, and then the balloon blows up in the trachea. And actually, I've, um, I intubated it at home by... So we're going to deflate the balloon, and we can actually put it in the tree. And if you feel it, you can feel the balloon right there, and then you blow it up in the tree. Not a Now it won't pull out. And the balloon is right here, you can feel it. So we can play with, you can play with that too. But basically it's sitting in the trachea. Um, one of the things you do is if you advance this too far, it'll go into the right main stem and only blow up one lung. So this is a good, this is a good intubation. Let's do a bad intubation. Why don't you guys want to go there? I see you. <laughs> We're only blowing one lung up now. You see how we only got it in one side? The other lung's not blowing at all. Can everybody see that? So that one isn't too far. So that's why we listen to breath sounds after we intubate to make sure that it's blowing up both lungs, not just one. Now we're up both. So they'll um, check for lung sounds after you intubate so that you can make sure that it is in the right place and blowing up both lungs. I don't want to mess up my big lungs. You can see they're pretty sturdy, the trachea is, isn't it? Could I do them this? <laughs> and it's not coming off. But you can actually feel the cartilage on here and everything. Oh, I got some gloves up here. <laughs> Mostly because it smells like formaldehyde. It's not infectious or anything. It's been cured, it's been cleaned and everything, but we keep it in the formaldehyde solution. So. Um, anyway, so that's intubation. You need it to have mechanical ventilation. And these are the mechanical ventilators. Um, and if you were in um, clinical, you would see a bunch of letters across the screen. Hopefully, at some point in your critical care clinicals, you saw a ventilator, and someone got to go in there and explain a little bit about the ventilator. All I'm going to hold you to is knowing what the alarms are for. Okay. I'm not going to make you memorize ventilator modes. We're going to go over them, but I am not going to test you on that. I am only going to test you on alarms. But just for your information, um, usually the mode is written somewhere on the thing. Usually there is a, this is what the ventilator is set at, and then you'll have a screen that says what your patient is doing so that you can see how your ventilator is set 
and then see what your patient is doing. Um, there will be breaths per minute. There will be your PEEP and your pressure support. If you have pressure support, that's extra air going in with each breath, and the PEEP is the end expiration. So we can do BiPAP on a ventilator by saying they have a pressure support of 10 and a PEEP of 5 or something like that. That's different pressure inhaling and then a pressure exhaling. Um, there are so many things on here. The ones that we need to worry about is the rate. So you can see that if the patient's rate is with the ventilator or above the ventilator. There's the oxygen level. Of course we want to know what oxygen level they're on. Are they on 40%, 80%, 100%? You want to know the oxygen level. Um, we like to know the pressure levels so that we know if the patient is on high pressures, they're requiring a lot of effort. We need a lot of extra ventilator support to get help. Is this patient on a lot of ventilator support? No, they're not getting any extra pressure in and they're only getting a small, tiny bit of peep. Um, us, ourselves, the way we breathe, we keep ourselves at a peep of five. They call that physiologic peep. That's what we do by not exhaling our full lung volume. We keep ourselves at a peep of five. And so that's what we try to maintain most ventilators with a PEEP of five, because that's our normal, how we keep our lungs open, is at that pressure. Um, we maintain that pressure inside of our lungs by, if we exhaled all of our air volume, our lungs would shrink up like these poor little lungs up here. So we don't do that, and it's very hard to do. If you've ever had a pulmonary function test where they make you exhale until the end of your breath, it's a lot of work, actually. And then it's a little bit harder to pull the breath in. So we don't do that. We maintain a little bit of lung volume in our lungs at all times, and that keeps us at a peak of five. So this patient's on hardly any ventilator support whatsoever. The ventilator's breathing a lot of times a minute, but he doesn't have to overcome a lot of resistance. So he's probably intubated for something that just needed respiratory control, not pressure. The more lung infection or fluid we have, the more pressure it's going to take to get past that. So patients with ARDS require a lot of pressure to push lung, to push air in past all that fluid and stuff. If you just had a pneumothorax and you needed to be intubated because you had a pneumothorax, do you think you're going to put a lot of pressure behind that? Well, heck no, they already got a hole in their lungs. So we're not going to put a lot of pressure behind that. They don't need the pressure to ventilate and pressure could make the problem worse. So every patient is different, and how we set the ventilator is different for every patient. So what I would say is in critical care clinical, ask about what the pressures are and what they're giving it for. For patients with pulmonary edema, pneumonia, ARDS, higher pressures. Patients with pneumothoraxes or holes or you know, maybe just pleural effusions on the outside of the lungs maybe don't need as much pressure to get in. Airway, asthma, what do you think they need? If they have airway closure or strider or asthma, are they going to need higher pressures or lower? Higher. higher to get past, to get air into those tight tubules. And then as their bronchodilators work and they start doing better, you'll see they need less and less pressure. So um, that's, per, that's prescribed per patient. What I need you to know is on the rest of these is what we're going to do to prevent any complications. They're already intubated. They were already in respiratory failure. They've received the ultimate treatment, which is the intubation in the ventilator. We need to make sure that um, we measure the tube placement and make sure it is correct at all times. So when you have your breathing tube, they will have a certain amount, and they will be measured either at the teeth or at the lips. And so when they intubate the patient, they will have a certain amount. They'll say, you know, tube in, 22 at the teeth, 22 at the lips, whatever that is. And that's meaning that, that they can see that number at the teeth. We usually try to say teeth versus lips because lips can swell and then the number changes a little bit. But some people don't have teeth at the gums. Um, but at the teeth, teeth are not movable or swellable, so that number doesn't change that much. So we try to say, you know, whatever the, whatever the depth is of the teeth. And then this one says, we all know the real reason Derek died. This tube was five centimeters at the teeth, which means it wasn't in at all. So really, once we get the tube in, so someone with a short airway will not be in as deep as someone who's got a long neck and a long airway. Um, yeah, it's like sitting out, I go, 
<laughs> anyway, yeah, so if it's right in here, you're not ventilating your patient because it's just in your mouth. So, um, so we will want to make sure um, where the depth of the, X, of the ET tube is, and then they will double check it on an x-ray and tell you where it should be, like pull it back a centimeter, pull it back two centimeters. And then once the, after the x-ray placement is in, that is the depth that it should stay in. So that's what we're checking every ship is where this ET tube is in the proper place on the x-ray, and that's where it should always be staying. So we need to make sure that ours doesn't get pushed in or pulled out too far. Um, they will check that this cuff is inflated. This is the cuff that inflates that balloon in the trachea. If it's deflated, this tube could move around. If it's inflated, it's nice and tight in the trachea there. And the RTs have a measurement device for that. Um, make sure they are suctioned frequently as needed. This patient can't cough their secretions out. This is their airway and you're the only one with access to it. So you have to take over for them and they need to be suctioned frequently. Every 20 minutes, probably too much. We probably want to suction the patient every half hour, every hour at the most, okay? We don't want to be suctioning them every 10, 15 minutes, and we're just sucking air out of them. So we want to suction them frequently, but not too frequently. It also causes trauma and coughing and stuff like that, but just be sure if you're suctioning and not getting anything, you maybe can do it every hour or two. Um, if you're suctioning and getting gobs and gobs and gobs of gooey stuff, you may want to do it every half hour or so. Uh, depends on how much pressure they have. Um, we'll talk about the alarms, but when the ventilator can't push air in, it'll send off an alarm saying, hey, I'm meeting a lot of resistance. If they don't have closed up airways, usually it's secretion. So if the ventilator is screaming high pressure alarm, it might be time to suction your patient even if you don't hear it. Um, if they have visible secretions or you can hear them or they have bronchi on auscultation, suction your patient. Clear their airway. Um, make sure that they are comfortable. They can do sedation. Not every patient on the ventilator needs sedation. In fact, if they are too over sedated, they'll never get off the ventilator. Um, so you may see some of that going on in the ICU areas where they're monitoring their sedation levels and trying to keep them just comfortable enough that they can tolerate the tube. Um, the, tape, the tube tape should be changed every 24 hours because if it sits in one corner of the mouth, it's going to erode the mouth. And so we take it and move it side to side every 24 hours to keep it from eroding part of the teeth. Um, they can talk. They can write you long, lengthy notes. And they can bang the side rail. So don't think that just because your patient's intubated that you are on, uh, yeah, no, sometimes my intubated patients take more time because they can't talk to you. And so they've got to communicate another way. But they can communicate. Um, one of the other big complicate, with the first big complication that we need to worry about and maintain is ventilator-associated pneumonia. You now have a tube for bacteria directly saying, here, come down this highway and just go on in. Um, bacteria can climb right down there and get into the, and then here's a warm, cool, dark environment full of humidified oxygen coming in, and um, it's full of secretions and nasties. So ventilator-associated pneumonia is a big, big, big one, and it's also a Medicare no-pay. If your patient gets a ventilator-associated pneumonia, they do not pay for the hospital stay. So hospitals are losing a ton of money on ventilator-associated pneumonias, and they do not want them to get them. So what we do is we prevent them. Now, you can recognize it well as a fever while on a ventilator. They're looking like they're getting pneumonia on chest x-rays. Their secretions go from being white or tan to yellow or green. Um, but we're going to try to prevent it. They need to have their head of the bed up. 35 degrees if they can take, or more if they can take it. 30 to 45 degrees. No patient on a ventilator should be flat unless there's no other reason for it. And if they have to be flat, what can we do with their bed? Reverse We can reverse Trendelenburg. We want their head up above their chest and their feet. And why is that? Why do you think we need to do that? We're making oral secretions constantly. We've got saliva in there. And if the head of the bed is up, it's a lot easier for that not to pool in the back of your throat and then get aspirated down the lungs. So if they're laying flat on their back, all those secretions will sit in the back of their throat and could easily get down, and those germs from your mouth can get down into your lungs. So head of the bed up, turn the patient 
chest PT, pat them on the back, turn them around, keep those secretions moving so they don't get pneumonia. They've already got a lot of germs. If there are germs in there, we want to keep them from living, having a good place to live. Oral care and suctioning routinely. So you will find these patients getting oral care every shift with chlorhexidine and antiseptic. We don't want germs from the mouth getting down into the lungs. Ensure your cuff is inflated because if that cuff is deflated, stuff can just drain right down the trachea. Um, drain in the water. We found that in the ventilator tubing, these patients were getting a ventilator-associated pneumonia with like this weird, um, I forget what it was. It wasn't pseudomonas. It was some weird bug that we hadn't had before. It was living in the ventilators. Someone hadn't been cleaning out the ventilators well. In fact, he changed all ventilator companies because the ventilators, there was this, I think it was like a mold spore that was in the ventilator. And then, of course, that ventilator is pushing air into the patient. So we want to make sure that all of this, um, all of this ventilator tubing gets changed out every 24 hours because any warm, mess, moldy environment, we just throw it away and put fresh stuff up. Every, all their suction stuff, everything gets changed every 24 hours. Um, suction is needed. Frequent suctioning keeps um, the patients from uh, getting those bacteria growing in there. And um, bless you. Um, have you seen the suctions that stay sterile? on the ventilated patients. It's like a little tube that kind of is attached to their ET tube, and it's in a sheath, and that's to keep it sterile, so that it only is attra it's only associating with, because they were finding when we would disconnect patients and suctioning them, that we were introducing more bacteria, so they developed these sterile sheathed um, suction catheters, and they get changed every 24 hours, in case there's junk in them. Um, Unplanned extubation. This is where, hey, you walk in, your patient's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk? What are you doing? <laughs> I don't think something's right. You're like, no, something's not right. <laughs> um, just not self extubate, that'd be great. Um, anyway, uh, what will happen on the alarm is it will read low pressure. So the ventilator's trying to push air in, and it's like, I'm not reading any resistance, dude. Derek's got that ET tube at five centimeters, that tube came out. Um, if the uh, balloon is faulty or leaky, or sometimes patients just grab it, it's uncomfortable. It's something sitting in your mouth and your throat. Patients, if they get any chance, you'll find a lot of them are restrained because if you get up there and grab it, you can pull it out. There's nothing really resistant. I mean, the balloon's soft. It'll go if you go to pull it. So um, anyway, just keeping your patient sedated or restrained so they don't accidentally, we call them reminder cuffs. We're like, we just have reminder wristbands on you so that you don't pull it. Because think about it, you wake up out of a deep sleep, especially if you've been sedated and you're confused. That's the first thing you're going to be like, what is in my mouth? And pull it out. So, um, but what will happen is if it happens while you're not in the room, the ventilator will alarm because it's trying to push air in. And it's like, dude, there's no resistance here. And it will have a low pressure alarm. And that's um, or the patient talking to you or having an air leak. Um, that means that the tube might not be in the right place, and of course that they have decreased oxygen sat. So um, some most common reasons of, um, is the tube becoming uh, dislodged. Um, oral and skin care. A lot of times these tubes will become loose because whatever tape or restriction holding them in place, or they have so many oral secretions, they're drooling out all over the place and they're holding in a place with tape, the tape becomes loose. If the tape becomes loose, this thing becomes a lot more easy to remove. So oral and skin care, just for whatever um, is holding it in place, doesn't come loose. Ensure the securement, maintain the cuff pressure, so make sure that this is staying inflated. Um, restraints or sedation to keep them from pulling it out. And don't, um, uh, yeah, tubes come out when we transport all the time. Because you're going in the elevator and you're trying to pull all these things into the elevator with you, and then all of a sudden you hear gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. Oh no! Who didn't know the ventilator? So anyway, because ventilator tubing gets caught and things get caught, whenever anything gets caught, something can come out. So just make sure that this is your airway. Make sure you maintain it. Um, what do you do with it? Tube came out. Patient was on a ventilator. What do you do? Bag them. Just go to bagging them. Even if they're like, I think I'm okay. They're like, you know what? I'm just going to make sure. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, you, you just had a tube in and we weren't planning on taking it out and now your tube's out. Sometimes patients extubate themselves when we're waiting too long to take the tube out and sometimes they do just fine. 
but you would want to monitor them. If you need to assist the respirations, bag them with 100% O2. So if they are not breathing more than 12 times a minute and maintaining their O2 sets, if they pull their tube out and they're maintaining their O2 sets and they're breathing, you know, 20 times a minute and they've got sets of 90, you might be like, you're good. We'll just stay here and watch you. But most of the time we're going to bag them until we can call somebody to get back. You can push the code button because if you've lost your airway, that is an emergency. So if you patient airway comes out and your SATs drop into 70, go ahead and push the air, the bag them and push the code button because you need someone to come and put that airway back in. So that's not fun. Um, they can have an actual lung injury because you could see when we were doing all that peep, we're pushing a lot of air in. They could pop a pneumo if they don't have a chest tube. So you're always listening to their chest sounds because patients on ventilator are having high air, and this could happen with um, BiPAP as well. You're pushing a lot of high pressure air in, and um, that can pop the lung. So a lot of high pressure air, always look for a pneumo with your patient, and that would be what? What are the signs of the pneumo? What would you hear? Demesis, that will be diminished in whatever low popped. We don't know where it is, but where does air go to live? It will rise. So you may have crepitus, and you may have diminished air sounds in whatever lobe it is, but sometimes pneumos will start. You will hear them up here because air is going to rise. So if they're breathing in air, you usually hear your pneumos in your upper lobes first, even if your lower lobe blew out because the air is going to rise. So just keep an eye on those, um, on those things. Breath sounds diminished or absent in affected lobes. Tachypnea, tachycardia, possibly decreased blood pressure. We said decreased blood pressure is good for all of them. Tachypnea and tachycardia, any pneumo. Decreased blood pressure if the pneumo gets really big. Um, low pressure alarms on the ventilator. What is happening there? The ventilator was pushing air against the lot of pressure. And then you blew a lung. Whew, that went in a lot easier. So the ventilator is like, wait a minute, that just got a lot easier. It might send off an alarm. Asymmetrical chest expansion. That's when there's not oxygenation on one side and there is on the other. Um, pneumothorax will worsen much quicker while ventilated because you're just still pushing air in at that high pressure. So a pneumothorax on a ventilator will not remain a small pneumo. It's usually a, um, it usually will turn into a big pneumo pretty quickly. Um, keep the low, um, oxygen as low as possible. Oxygen is actually toxic to the alveoli at high levels. So 100% O2 will make those alveoli stiff and sore, and they are much more prone to bursting with high O2 levels. So keep the O2 as low as possible. We will add more pressure and decrease the O2. That's fine. We'll use pressure because you can see how much pressure helped, whereas oxygen may not help that much. If once we get the lungs open, a lower level of oxygen will oxygenate open lungs. So we will use more pressure to decrease the amount of oxygen. Having them on a low-pressure ventilator at a high oxygenation causes lung damage. High O2 damage lungs. So we don't think about that, but high oxygen is actually toxic to the lungs. Uh, praying pain, the pressure support as low as possible to maintain your oxygenation because we don't want high, high pressures. So you can see when that peep was up at 20, you guys were worried that it was going to blow across the room. Well, that would be the same for a patient on a ventilator with a peep of 20. That could cause a lot of problems. Um, if you think you have a pneumo, chest x-ray and chest tube. And here are the alarms that you will need to know. So high pressure limit, here's the reasons that the ventilator has resistance getting in the air to the patient. Low pressure limit, no resistance to pumping air. And your apnea alarm goes off when the ventilator doesn't set your, set your patient breathing. So some ventilators are set that they can breathe on their own and it gives them some time. And if there's been like 10 seconds without a breath, it'll set off the apnea alarm. What it'll do is it'll start breathing for the patient and set off the apnea alarm. So it's not going to let your patient not breathe. It'll set off a rescue breathing that the ventilator will start breathing for them at a certain amount per minute and then set off a apnea alarm. So you might need to look at your patient to see if they have, are breathing and have a pulse. 
and you might need to look at them and see if they're over sedated. Because if the patient has an apnea alarm set, it means that they're allowed to do some of the stuff on their own. And if the patient has stopped doing anything on their own, there's something changing with the patient. Um, there's high tidal volume, high ven minute ventilations. This is where the ventilator is set to give a certain amount of air with each breath or monitor a certain amount of air in and out. And so if the patient starts breathing at a respiratory rate of 30, they're moving a lot of air per minute. And that might be something that sets off an alarm. Or the patient doesn't breathe enough, might set off the alarm. But what I want you to know is what to do when your alarms go off. So a high pressure alarm goes off. You go in the room and it says high pressure and your patient is gurgling and making noises and you see stuff coming out around their mouths. What are you gonna do? Suction. Suction them. If they're talking to you and there's a low pressure alarm, yeah, there's something wrong, there's a leak somewhere in the system, you'll have to assess the cuffs. So basically, I would like you to be able to go in and if I tell you there's an alarm, you know what to look for, okay, and what to troubleshoot, which is what I think is important for you taking care of a patient safely in the ICU. I don't think it's important that you know the ventilator modes. I do have them in here if you would like them. But I would stop at making sure that you can take care of the patient safely so that you are, can recognize the complications of being ventilated. So if you're taking care of the patient with a ventilator, um, there are things that you do every shift to look at. You're going to measure the depth, make sure the cuff is inflated, suction frequently, depending on the patient. But don't go too crazy. You don't want to suction them all the time. Um, you're going to make sure that they don't get a ventilator-associated pneumonia. You're going to make sure they don't extubate themselves. And you're going to make sure that they don't blow a, a, blow a lung. And they, so you're going to listen to the breath sounds. And then if any of their alarms go off, you know what could happen. So if there are high-pressure alarms going off, you're going to look for secretions. You're going to look for the patient maybe gagging or coughing or trying to do something against the tube. They might need more sedation. They might need to be sedated. They might need to be suctioned. Um, they may have water in the ventilator. Maybe the ventilator got kinked somewhere along the line, some of the tubing. Anything that allows the ventilator not to get air in. So we're just going to start with the patient, make sure everything looks good, check all the way to the ventilator, and make sure there's no kinks or anything in the tubing. Um, and then this could be just that they're having a bronchospasm, maybe an asthmatic patient with a high pressure limit. Maybe their bronchodilator, maybe it's time for their bronchodilator. <clears throat> maybe they're having trouble getting air in. We're going to have to look at the whole thing, but I want you to know the reasons why high pressure limits happen and why low pressure limits happen, which is usually something's not right. There's a disconnect somewhere. Um, they, they extubated themselves or they've got a cuff leak. And what do you think you would do for those things? Take care of those things. So you would be on the lookout for that. So I do have the, um, the modes here, but do not spend time on the modes. Okay, That's going to be memorizing that you don't need to do for this test. Um, so I put them there, and you can read about them, especially if you've had a patient on a certain kind. You could kind of read about it and know a little bit more about it.